The title of our sermon this evening is Lewdness and Outrage in Israel. Lewdness and Outrage in Israel. It's from the the Levite's words himself in describing what had happened to the Benjamites uh, in chapter 20, where he said that he took hold of his concubine, cut her in pieces, sent her out throughout all the territory of the inheritance of Israel because they committed lewdness and outrage in Israel. We're struck by the lewdness that's committed here in Israel. And tonight, as we arrive at chapter 19 in our study of the book of Judges, we descend, as it were, uh, one of the darkest staircases, uh, enter into one of the darkest rooms in what is one of the darkest corners in the basement of redemptive history. Far away from the light of truth or reason, there are dark things that are done there, things done by them in secret that are too shameful even to speak about. Dark things done by men who have become futile in their thoughts, as Paul would later say, their foolish hearts being darkened, professing to be wise, they've become fools. We've seen at this point throughout the book of Judges how they have continued to exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for an image made like corruptible man, forsaking the law of God, multiplying their household idols, the covenant people of God now ensnared by the pagan practices of the Canaanites. And the Lord had warned them. He was careful to warn them about the darkness lurking in that basement. If you remember from chapter 2, verse 2, the Lord said, you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars. In other words, what fellowship does light have with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? What part has a believer with an unbeliever? Right? Make no covenant, covenants with the inhabitants of this land. Tear down their altars. But the Lord said, tragically, right, you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Therefore, I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be thorns in your side, and their gods shall be a snare to you. And we see that coming to full fruition here at the end of the book of Judges. There is a consequence, isn't there, for dabbling in darkness. There is a consequence to our sin. In progressively increasing judgment for their sin, we see in this last section of the book of Judges, not a people merely given over to external enemies like the Philistines or like the Midianites. We now see a people given over to uncleanness. We see a people now given up to vile passions. And this is the consequence of their sin. This is the consequence of their depravity. We see a people given up to a darkness that dwells within their own heart. And we see the extent, the pervasiveness of that depravity expressed by Paul in Romans 1 as men leaving the natural use of the woman, burning in their lust for what is shameful, receiving within themselves the penalty or the judgment of their error which was due. right? Receiving within themselves the judgment or the penalty of their error which was due. And we see it manifest now in the actions of these men in Gibeah. Even as these in Israel, during the period of the judges, did not like to retain God in their knowledge. God has given them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, being filled with sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, right? In the righteous judgment of God, not only those who practice such things are deserving of death, but those also who approve of those who practice them. And what we see now in this last section of the book of Judges as we begin chapter 19 tonight is a consequence. It's not just their external conduct. It's a consequence. It's a judgment, the judgment of God upon Israel's apostasy. It's the judgment of God upon their sin. What we see in their conduct is the judgment of God upon them. That apostasy, that turning away from God, is described by the familiar refrain here at the end of the book, 
In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. We see a nod to that refrain given to us in Judges chapter 19, verse 1. Look at verse 1 with me. And it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel that there was a certain Levite staying in the remote mountains of Ephraim. That statement that you see there in verse 1, in those days when there was no king in Israel, that statement is meant to remind us that the account that we are about to hear is one in which everyone is doing what is right in their own eyes. It's not unlike what we see in our own country today, is it? Uh, Not unlike what we see in the professing church at large in our country today. Everyone seeming to be doing what is right in their own eyes, not following the word of God. And what they do here, what they do in Judges chapter 19 is reprehensible across the board, as we'll see. But what they do isn't quite the issue. It's the standard they apply in doing it that should arrest our attention, right? What is the standard that they apply? What they do is what they think or what they believe is right to do. They're doing what is right in their own eyes. And the account that follows now is a scathing indictment on what happens when you live that way. When you live doing what is right according to your own eyes, this is the end which results in death. This is the end of that road, right? This is the end which results in destruction. It's a scathing indictment on men's wisdom, a scathing indictment on what men do that is right in their own eyes. The period of the judges is a 400-year period, a 400-year demonstration that we need a king, a king that would restrain the wicked conduct of his people. But not just any king, not just any king, the nation of Israel would reject God as king in 1 Samuel chapter 8, and the period of the monarchy then is a 1,000-year demonstration that we don't just, just need any king, we need a righteous king, a righteous king that would restrain the wicked conduct of his people. In immeasurable grace, in immeasurable mercy, in covenant loving kindness, God would then send a righteous king, wouldn't he? The scepter of his kingdom is the scepter of righteousness. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. It would be ordered and established with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. And what do... The fallen, sinful, depraved covenant people of God to then do. They do what is right in their own eyes, and they murder that righteous king that the Lord has sent. They mock him, they scourge him, and they hang him on a Roman cross to die. And what we realize is that the problem of our depravity won't be solved by mere external restraints to our behavior. (laughs) The problem of man's depravity will not be solved, will not be curbed by mere external restraints on their depravity, on their conduct. What we need is the internal transformation of our very nature. We need a new heart. We need transformation. We need a new heart that heaps contempt on what I would have seen as right in my own eyes. (laughs) It heaps contempt on what I would deem to be right. A heart that longs for what is right in the king's eyes. A heart that longs, that hungers and thirsts for righteousness. Our remaining corruption rebels against the rule and reign of that king who works all things together for our good. And our rebellion, think with me, our rebellion, brothers and sisters, our rebellion, whether in big ways or whether in what we may think are small ways, our rebellion is best expressed by that very same statement that characterized These Gibeonites, these Benjamites in Israel in Judges chapter 19. We have rejected Christ as king when we live that way, and we are doing what is right in our own eyes. And that sin, that sin of rebellion, doing what is right in our own eyes, living according to our own wisdom, 
that sin is directly attached by a string of heart motive to the wickedness that we see on display in these chapters in the book of Judges. It's attached by heart motive. In the same way that the Lord Jesus Christ came in Matthew chapter 5 saying, you've heard it said that you're not to commit murder, but I say to you, right? You've heard it said that you should not commit adultery, but I say to you, whoever looks upon a woman to lust after her in his heart has already committed adultery with her in his heart. The same standard applies here. That very same statement can be applied to us in our rebellion when we are doing what is right in our own eyes, and that sin is directly attached by a string of heart motive to the wickedness that we see now on display in Judges chapter 19. It doesn't always show up, does it? It doesn't always manifest itself or end up in the dark perversity of homosexuality or of rape or of murder, but it often shows up, doesn't it? in the sanitized, outwardly clean cup of hypocrisy. (laughs) It shows up often in uh, quote-unquote respectable sins of pride or apathy or indifference or discontentment or complaining. It shows up when we complain, doesn't it? It shows up when we make excuses shows up when we ignore his word. That sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you. And Judges chapter 19 is a a demonstrable, uh, an overtly wicked display of the ends of that sin, of the ends of that path to cause you and I, brothers and sisters, to fear that path, to fear the Lord, to turn from it and to follow after him, not doing what is right in our own eyes, but doing what is right in his eyes. The section of the book uh, divides well according to the chapters. In chapter 19, we're going to see uh, the depravity of Benjamin, and we'll begin that tonight and finish next week. In chapter 20, we'll see the defeat of Benjamin, and in chapter 21, we'll see the dilemma of Benjamin, the depravity of Benjamin, the defeat of Benjamin, the dilemma of Benjamin, and that'll take us to the end of the book. And through it all, Through it all, as we look through these chapters, we'll see an absolutely amazing technicolor splendor, the absolute implacable, unflappable, persistent, consistent, insistent faithfulness of Almighty God to his promises in the face of what is horrendous and grievous sin among his people. God is faithful even when we are faithless. God keeps his word. Well, let's begin in chapter 19 with the depravity of Benjamin, the depravity of Benjamin. Look at verse 1 with me. It came to pass in those days, when there was no king in Israel, that there was a certain Levite staying in the remote mountains of Ephraim. Now don't forget, don't forget that the spiritual collapse of chapter 17, the spiritual collapse of chapter 18 that we've already looked at together, involved an unnamed Levite, didn't it? It involved an unnamed Levite. Here, the ensuing moral collapse of the country also involves an unnamed Levite. In other words, the wickedness that we're about to encounter here in Judges chapter 19 is not an outlier. It's impacting the Levites, right? This isn't a fringe problem, an outlier problem. This represents a spiritual rottenness in the heart of Israel that has infected the heart of the nation. It's a spiritual gangrene that is spread through the body. It's infected the heart of Israel's worship. It's infected the heart of Israel's covenant relationship to her God. And in verse 1, this unnamed Levite took for himself an unnamed concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. That's interesting to me in thinking about that, that the lack of names given for the main historical figure figures in the account, it gives you the sense that this could have been any Levite in Israel, doesn't it? The fact that there's no name given, it gives you the sense that it could have been any Levite. It could have been any concubine. It could have been any woman. It could have been any woman who has given herself as a concubine to a man. Anyone could have been involved in this scenario. Any Levite could have been caught acting in these ways, as we'll see. Any woman, any woman could have been the victim of rape or murder, or dismemberment at this period, at this point in Israel's history. Anyone, a willing participant in the circumstances of this gross apostasy, 
among God's covenant people. Jeremiah would later say that from the prophet even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. Everyone's doing what is right in his own eyes, including this unnamed Levite and his concubine. Now, a concubine is more property than wife, more slave than spouse. But what was the Levite's concubine like? Look at verse 2. But his concubine played the harlot against him and went away from him to her father's house at Bethlehem in Judah and were, was there four whole months. And as horrendous as the events are that surround this woman, we have to remember that her demise began with harlotry in verse 2. The concubine, concubine played the harlot against him in verse 2, went away from him to her father's house. So, verse 3, then her husband arose and went after her to speak kindly to her and to bring her back, having a servant and a couple of donkeys with him. So she brought him into her father's house, and when the father of the young woman saw him, he was glad to meet him. Now his father-in-law, the young woman's father, detained him, and he stayed with him three days, and so they ate and drank and lodged there. All seems to be peaceful at the outset, doesn't it? All seems to be peaceful. It's like the calm before the storm, so to speak. But even in the circumstances, there seems to be an underlying tension that's sitting there that all things are not as they should be here in Israel. The text says that they refresh themselves, they make themselves merry, but it appears even at the outset, maybe it's because we know what, how the story goes, but it appears here that the, there's a shallow peace that they enjoy. There's a misplaced sense of calm. There's a misplaced sense of security. But the young woman's father is very hospitable to the Levite, shows great hospi hospitality. In verse 4, her father detains him. Verse 5, refresh your heart, he says. Afterward, go your way. Verse 6, be content to stay all night. Let your heart be merry. Verse 8, refresh your heart. Verse 9, lodge here that your heart may be merry. Right? Her father showing great hospitality uh, to this Levite. But the whole story reminds me a little bit of Christian and Hopeful uh, as they were walking through the enchanted ground. You remember that? Fighting to stay awake, fighting to stay alert as they walk through enchanted, enchanted ground, growing sleepy. Here, this Levite should be watchful. There's something coming. He should be sober-minded. They're refreshing their hearts, drinking, making merry, but there's no reason in this country at this time with the sin abounding as it is where they should be refreshing their heart, making merry, uh, they should be watching. They should be sober. They are oblivious to the fact that that very night, the soul of the concubine will be required of her, and the nation will be placed on the brink of civil war. It's interesting, isn't it, how we can go seemingly at peace, seemingly as though everything were completely fine, not realizing the danger that lurks. And here, their continuous delay leads to a fateful decision, a bad decision. The Levite takes those with him and leaves when the day is half spent. In other words, this Levite lacks wisdom. He doesn't leave when he should leave, and then he does leave when he shouldn't leave. It's going to end him up in some hot water. Verse 10, however, this man was not willing to spend that, the night. So he arose, departed, and came opposite Jebus, that is Jerusalem. This was before Jerusalem was taken by David. The Jebusites lived there. Now with him, with the man, were two saddled donkeys. His concubine was also with him. They were near Jebus, and the day was far spent. And the servant said to his master, Come, please, and let us turn aside into this city of the Jebusites and lodge in it. But his master said to him, we will not turn aside here into a city of foreigners who are not of the children of Israel. We will go on to Gibeah. So he said to his servant, Come, let us draw near to one of these places and spend the night in Gibeah or in Ramah. Now in this, the Levite is logical, isn't he? But the logic of the Levite will soon be exposed as, an uns as unsubstantiated among his own people. They passed by, they went their way. In verse 14, the sun went down on them near Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin. And they turned aside there to go into lodge in Gibeah. And when, it, and when he went in, he sat down in the open square of the city, for no one would take them into his house to spend the night. Now think about that in great contrast to the woman's father, right? the concubine's father, and how hospitable he was. Here, they go into 
uh, Gibeah. And even amongst their own people, no one would take them into their house to spend the night. So it's one of the primary reasons why they spent or went the additional four miles north of Jerusalem to turn aside into a town inhabited by Israelites. And yet, turning into that town, they show him no hospitality. It's in great contrast to the woman's father. They wind up in a place where they had every reason to believe that there they should be shown some hospitality. They wind up in a place where they had every reason to believe that there they should be safe, that there they should be secure, a place inhabited by God's people. And yet they are shown no hospitality until the old man comes along. No one would take them into their house to spend the night. This would have been shocking to a Jewish reader, right? The Jews would have been shocked. The children of Israel have become, as we've seen, canonized. Doing what is right in their own eyes has made them inhospitable. <laughs> well, the old man of verse 16 comes to the rescue of the Gibeonite reputation, the Benjamite <laughs> reputation. So the old man of verse 16, who happens to be from the same area as the Levite, does his part to sully or to salvage their sullied reputation, and he actually shows some hospitality. But however hospitable his actions, what comes next will render their shocking lack of hospitality a distant concern. A lack of hospi hospitality is the least of the concern. It's like complaining about bad breath on a serial killer. The bad breath is not the problem. The serial killer is... <laughs> Beginning in verse 20, we'll see an urgent appeal, a perverted attack, a heartless deal, and then a devastating outcome. First, follow along with me, the urgent appeal, verse 20. The old man said, peace be with you. However, let all your needs be my responsibility. Only do not spend the night in the open square. Seems like the old man knew something, right? He brought him into his house, verse 21, gave fodder to the donkeys, and they washed their feet and ate and drank. There seems to be a sense of urgency on the part of this older man in verse 20. He seems to know that something isn't right. That older man certainly would have known what the citizens of Gibeah would have been like. The travelers may have been uh, safer along the roadways. And now that they are in the city square, this man seems to know that this is the case. The urgent appeal. Look secondly at a perverted attack. The perverted attack, verse 22. As they were enjoying themselves, suddenly... Certain men of the city, perverted men, surrounded the house and beat on the door. They spoke to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring out the man who came to your house that we may know him carnally. Well, so much for hospitality in Gibeah, right? Perverted men, translated there by the New King James. Verse 22, literally, men of the sons of Belial. Men of the sons of the devil. It's an indictment on the entire male population here in Gibeah. Their lust, their depravity, seen in the description of these men beating on the door. Beating on the door. You can't read this record, can you, without thinking of another story in the Bible. Do you remember? It's the account of Sodom in Genesis chapter 19. There's striking similarities here, aren't there? Striking similarities. There's certainly different outcomes, but the similarities are intentional. Think with me. The, intention, the, the circumstances, the similarities are intentional on the part of the writer, and the similarities are striking. The grammar is similar. The word choice is similar. Often the same phrases are repeated. Even the word count is similar. Our author here intends for us to see a connection. Now, why would that be? Well, this is the way in which our author shames Gibeah for her depravity. By connecting Gibeah, by connecting Benjamin to the sin of Sodom, to that city on which God rained down fire from heaven. Gibeah becomes future Sodom. Do you see? It's a way in which our author casts shade, <laughs> heaps shame upon Benjamin, upon Gibeah. Have you noticed throughout this account to this point, who is uh, in the account that 
appears strangely silent while all of this is going on. We haven't heard yet from God, have we? It seems to this point that God is strangely silent. Why is that? It's as if God is giving them enough rope to hang themselves while they do what is right in their own eyes. They're making decisions on their own. We'll look at the conclusion of the matter next week. We'll see how the people respond. We're to see in Gibeah the canonization of the Israelites. We're to see in Benjamin Sodom, future Sodom. We're to see their sin connected to the depravity of Sodom that drew the judgment of God. And we draw a thread, don't we, to anything that resembles that sin in our day. There are not many in the pews of churches today who would not express outrage, outrage over the lewdness of Gibeah. They'd read this account and they'd be outraged over the sin of Benjamin, outraged over what happens to this woman, outraged over the perversity of those men, outraged over the depravity of man's heart, outraged over the offense that it is against our God, outraged over their depravity, right? Not many in the pews of any church who would express outrage over this lewdness, who themselves are a party to perversity as they sit at their computer on a Saturday night prior to sitting in worship on a Sunday morning, right? Just a click away from that same perversity, just a, a click away from that same depravity, the seeds of Sodom lying within the soil of their own heart. And what we're to do, brothers and sisters, in reading an account like this is not to think to ourselves that we're so distant from that, right? We're so far away from that. Uh, that is so wicked and, 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 and whitewash the outside of our cup. When within the heart of man, that sin lies at the door and its desire is for you. Do you see? Um, we're not to keep a sanitized distance from the sin of Sodom. We're not to keep a sanitized distance from this perversity that we see in Gibeah. Um, this is the depravity of man. Uh, the heart is deceitful, desperately wicked. And Brothers and sisters, we need to fear God and cling to Jesus Christ in faith. We need to turn from our sin, heap contempt, heap shame upon our own depravity, upon our own hearts, and cling to Jesus Christ in faith for forgiveness, for cleansing, right? You read a story like this, and you just want clean, fresh air in your lungs, clean, fresh water, right? Uh, you just want righteousness to reign. And in large part, because we see the same perversity so um, pervasive in our own country, uh, let it not be so named among us. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we, um, with those who would read the story, Lord, are shocked by what we read here, shocked by what we see on the, in the pages of Scripture, shocked by what sinful, fallen man is capable of. And we praise you for having made provision for our sin. Praise you, Lord, for having, by your Spirit, caused us to be born again and have made us new creations in Christ, or that you have set us free from bondage to our sin. And uh, we praise you and thank you, Lord, that we, in the power of the Spirit, uh, have the blessed joy, Lord, now to turn from sin, to live for you, to love you as we should, to devote ourselves to you, to obey you as we should, to follow after you, not doing what is right in our own eyes, not leaning on our own understanding, but leaning and depending upon you. We thank you, Lord, for saving our wretched souls. Thank you, God, for saving us from sin, saving us from your wrath. 
Uh, Lord, please help us to take warning from these texts in Scripture uh, to cling tightly to you in faith. Help us, Lord, uh, to take warning uh, from these passages in Scripture and to avoid that path like the plague and to cling to you. Thank you for this time together tonight, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for these examples in Scripture. I pray, Lord, that we would live for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.